Wow. But I haven't seen the full head of hair yet. Super Saiyan, dude. Yeah. Super Saiyan Pumphrey in the house. This isn't even my final form. Whoa. What is your final? What do you think your final? What would your final form be, James? Just freaking ripped. <laughs> so buff. Just buffed out. That's it. That's it. Yours buff. Blonde, <laughs> white, blonde hair. People are going to be like, he didn't even pick up a weight until he was 35. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be now. That's going to be my uh like my next career is going to be I'm going to get really ripped and then do a self-help YouTube. No, oh, that's like motivational speaking YouTube. Oh, that's cool. When I was 34, I weighed 247 pounds. I had a heart attack. Oh. And now I'm ripped as fuck. I got two hot Wives, <laughs> <laughs> I own a yacht and a biplane that lands on water, and it looks just like the sea duck from Tailspin. <laughs> That'd be so sick. I heard a really cool story about Amelia Earhart. Yeah, she was at an air show, and a woman pilot like crashed, and she was she was hurt, but she was she didn't die. And a guy next to her was like, "That's why women shouldn't fly planes." And she was like. In a bunk or like a what do they call it? Not a bunker. Hanger. A hanger. Grabbed a plane and just like started doing all these tricks and shit and landed. At a party? No, at a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I came that story a little late. Past ass podcast. It's about cars. It's not about sports. I have no cool stories about anything, so let's just get right into it. Uh, what? This is literally this is a cool story show, Nolan. That you... I have one on my screen that I'm going to read to you. Please today. do. All right. Hey, welcome to Past Gas. Welcome to the Past Cast Podcast. Uh, yeah, it's a, a donut podcast. Uh, as you know, never mind. Uh, with, with me today, I'm Nolan Sykes. I've got James Pumphrey sitting across from me. Hello, toot, James. Toot. And in the studio today, we have another third uh, host, uh, Joe from. <laughs> from is, the PT episodes. <laughs> hey guys, this yeah, is already yeah. feeling fun. Yeah, it's already I, fun. You guys did a couple of three-person uh, episodes when I was gone. Yeah, in your absence. But this is my first three-person episode, and already it's different. It's fun. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's good, good dynamic. Yeah, it's not just me and Nolan talking, no. which is aw awesome. Could, yeah, <laughs> but if you want to go from eighty to one ten, pull out the Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Pull that, out a little that secret. classic metric, eighty to one ten. That <laughs> cars are healthy. <laughs> uh, today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite cars, uh, the Nissan GTR, and it's probably a lot of your guys' favorite cars too. Whenever yeah. we do anything on the Skyline Skyline GTR, you guys just eat it up. Really positive responses in the comments, lots of views. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, we we don't just like pull stuff out of our boots, out of our booties. We want to give you guys stuff that you like. Yeah. So uh, why don't you email us if you have any ideas for episodes you'd like us to cover at Do pass have... gas, pass gas at donut media. I'll make it. Okay. Between this time and the time that this episode is. So <laughs> we're, not, some... we're not going to do a podcast on your cars, so don't. Yeah, we're not. Us yeah. Pictures of your cars. Yeah, we're not. Yeah, we're not going to do a podcast on your build. But, you know, fun, crazy, kooky stories from automotive history, that's what we love, and we're going to have to do a million of these. Uh, so, so, please, yeah. I used to joke that oh, I'm going to do a new one of these every week till the day I yeah. die, and then I almost died. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't like that joke anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to be honest, that one did make me a little nervous <laughs> when you start saying that. <laughs> yeah, because, uh, I don't know. That's yeah, <laughs> I like just assumed like the day I die was really far away, <laughs> but no, it turns out it could have been two Wednesdays ago. Could have been three episodes in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so the GTR. Um, first, we're gonna start out with a little Datsun history. Okay, just laying it out for you guys some some cool. Datsun history, some context, and then we'll really get into it. So uh, I think this is gonna be a two parter. So just look out. So dig in, yeah. you little. Choo choos, listen up close, but not too close because a lot of you guys are driving. Pay attention to the road, but sit back and because we're gonna spin a tail. <laughs> All right, in 1911, a Japanese engineer by the name of Masahiro Hashimoto founded his own car company called the Kwai. <laughs> God dang <it>. already. <laughs> Look, I'm gonna. I'm for sure going to butcher a lot of these names, so just bear with me, guys. Okay. It, his company was called the Quine, 
Kwaishinsha, <laughs> Kwaishinsha Company in Tokyo's Azabu Hiru District. In 1914, his car was ready. For the name, the company used the first letter of each of Masujiro's three investors, um, which were D A T. Uh, which, according to Nissan's website, also means lightning fast in Japanese. Sick. Yeah. I was, uh, wasn't was able to confirm this, so we're just going to take Nissan's word for it. The Dat car, also known as the Dat Go, uh, looked kind of like a Model T and was a modest success for the Kwaishinsha company. Who if you're gonna get a, If you're going to get a car, you want to get one to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's got to have wheels. It's got to have Motors. the ability to move. Yeah. In 1926, Kwaishinsha merged with a company called the Jitsuyo Jidosha, Jitsuyo Jidosha to form the Dat Jitsuyo Saitso Company. Five years later, Dat Jitsuyo Jidosha merged with the Tobata Company. Tobata's owner, Yoshisuka Aikawa, envisioned a lightweight, affordable car for the people built with materials local to the factory. Uh, this car needed a name, so they called it the Son of Dot, or the Dotson. Whoa. In 1933, Dot Jitsuyo Saitso dropped the Dot part of their name for just Jitsuyo Saitso, as, and uh, they became the automotive manufacturing uh, division of Tobata. A year later, they changed their name again to an abbreviation of their holding company, Nihon Sangyo, or... Nissan. Nissan. They continued to make their Datsun cars and began exporting them around the world. Nissan's first major motorsport achievement was in 1958. The Datsun 210 sedan had won its class in the grueling Australian Rally Championship. Uh, the win gave the Datsun major cred around the world and opened the door to exports to more countries. But this was just the beginning of Nissan's time in motorsport. In 1963, the inaugural Japanese Grand Prix was held at Suzuka Circuit. The track was developed by Soichiro Honda of the Honda Company with intended use as a test course for his cars. The track was designed by one Hans Hugenholz, a fact I included because his name is fun to say. <laughs> That's a weird Japanese name. Hans Hugenholz. Hans Hugenholz. Hans Hugenholz. Basically, the Japanese Grand Prix was organized so Japanese manufacturers could show off their cars and easily beat privateer teams driving European cars. Unfortunately, though, guys, the opposite happened. In the race's first year, a Lotus 23 took the win, and in 1964, a private team driving a mid-engine Porsche 904 snatched the checkered flag. Europe European cars were winning the Japanese Grand Prix, Something had to be done. That is embarrassing. Yeah, not a great look. So what do you mean by privateer companies? Oh, so just like, or privateer teams, rather. So like... It means that, like it's like not owned by a manufacturer, it's owned by a rich guy. Yeah. So wouldn't that just be private companies, not just private... Like So it's like civilians or whatever. Like So if I owned a race team and ran at Le Mans, I'd be a privateer team. Yeah, there's, okay. no, there's not manufacturer backing. Because yeah. I always think of like... British pirates as privateers. Okay. <laughs> so it's just, I mean, I am I thought it was like pirates coming in. You're out of... That's Joe, let's get this guy. Way <laughs> wrong. <laughs> We're talking about uh, ships, right? These are ships racing? Yeah. Yeah, they're land ships. <laughs> the Prince Motor Company was a smaller automaker who specialized in personal luxury cars. Some of their more famous nameplates included the Prince Gloria and most notably the Prince... Skyline. Skyline. Prince's chief engineer, Shinichiro Sakurai, saw the European domination at Suzuka firsthand and had a plan to end it. Born in Yokohama in 1929, Shinichiro was a no-nonsense man who expected the absolute best from his employees, much like you, James. Yeah, I do. It's a tough cross that I've chosen to bear. <laughs> He was known to train freshman engineers by making them practice tracing lines from morning to quitting time for weeks. His reasoning that if his reasoning was that if a designer who was trained in technical drawings could not see the point in drawing simple lines and gave up, then they shouldn't be designing cars. Sakurai took a page from Porsche's book and began designing a mid-engine race car of his own, but there was a small hurdle. 
He had never designed a mid-engine race car before, so he purchased a used Brabham BT8 chassis, reverse-engineered it, and uh, he found out what made it tick. So, I mean, that's kind of the easy way to design a car is by... And that's, like, pretty common, too. Like, if you're developing... an Like, for instance, we do work with Pininfarina, mm-hmm. and they just have every supercar at their office. No way. Yeah. Using what he learned from the BT-8... Sakurai designed his own car called the R380. It had a steel tube frame chassis and a modified G7 from the Skyline, making 200 horses and 127 pounds-feet of torque. <laughs> it's a revy little guy. Yeah. Uh, also, from the outside, it looks suspiciously like the 904. If you look at pictures of them next to each other, it's like, Ugh. But that was <laughs> probably a coincidence, right? With a curb weight of just under 50. 50- 1500 pounds the r380 was a rocket achieving an average top speed of uh, achieving an average speed rather of 165 miles an hour over 31 miles at the yatabe test oval in japan and what year is this this is a 1964 that's cool same year the mustang came out yeah put it in perspective um unfortunately prince didn't get to run the r380 At the event, it was designed for as the Japanese Grand Prix was postponed until 1966. Dang. Unfortunately, when it did come time to race, Porsche had a brand new race car, the 906, and looked like it was posed to, or poised, rather, to destroy Prince. The 906 had more power, it was lighter, and was more aerodynamic than the R380, but Prince did have one advantage, numbers. Prince bought four R380s to the race against the Solo 906. The Porsche broke down that day, and Prince got their revenge. Japan had finally won the Japanese Grand Prix. Nice. That was super cool. I still <laughs> hung up on a prince named Gloria. Prince I think Gloria. that'd be really funny. Prince Gloria. What's the male version of Gloria? Is it Glorian? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Glorio. Glorio. <laughs> Glorio does sound like a name. Uh, but the R380 wasn't the only car Prince had been com- campaigning at the racetrack. Prince was also entering the Skyline sedan, competing in the GT2 class. Uh, these racing Skylines were outfitted with a less powerful version of the G7 the R380 eventually used, which required extending the wheelbase of the stock car. A triple Weber carb setup fed the straight-six engine fuel and air, and power went to the ground through a close ratio transmission and a limited slip differential. Prince called this car the Skyline 2000 GT. Mm-hmm. Uh, remember the 1964 race that Porsche won, guys? I do. Yeah. Great, because that was only five minutes ago when I told you that. That'd be troubling if you didn't. Uh, <laughs> Prince secured places two through six. It was a beast and went on sale to the Japanese public in 1965. After the R380's win in 1966, Sakurai had not forgotten about his little sedan with a big engine. Now that Prince had won its home race, he can now focus on making the Skyline even better. Sakurai took a slightly detuned G7 from the Prince R380 and stuffed it under the hood. He took two doors off it and put on a new badge. He called it the Skyline GTR. I've heard of those. Yeah. <laughs> this is the first one? You just saw it get born before your eyes. Oh, gross. <laughs> it's all covered in goop. <laughs> A big thanks to our sponsor, Valvoline Oil. Why would you trust any other oil when Valvoline has been around for over 150 years? You think I'm messing with you? I'm being serious. They've been around since 1866 and were the first to file a patent for motor oil. They are the original motor oil. Not only that, they made the first high mileage oil, the first race oil, and the first synthetic oil blend. Still think I'm messing with you? You've got some deep-rooted trust issues, buddy. All Valvoline oils exceed industry standards to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road. That's why some of the best in the biz use Valvoline. Like my pretty much uncle, Mario Andretti, to my pretty much best friend, Chris Forsberg, to me, All three of us badass dudes are hard on our engines, so you know that we would only use the most durable oil. If not, everything would blow up. Valvoline is the only motor oil with a dedicated engine lab where they're able to run specialized and standardized engine tests right in their own facility. 
Thanks, Valvoline, for supporting Past Gas. Support the companies that support Donut. That's how we get to make this stuff. It was a big deal for Nissan to put that winning engine in a passenger car. Sports sedans like this didn't really exist back then, unless you count the muscle cars that were at their peak over in America, but those didn't really handle very well. The GTR, on the other hand, did. Nice. With 160 horsepower and semi-trailing arm suspension, the Skyline GTR was an absolute maniac at the track, even with four doors. Uh, today, a car weighing 2,400 pounds with that much power would be a hit. For reference, the ND Miata convertible weighs about 2,300 pounds and makes 180 horsepower, and it's basically the perfect sports car. Uh, the GTR, they nailed it, basically, yeah. from the beginning is what I'm saying. I had no idea they were that small. Yeah, they're tiny. Yeah, when you, it's so weird when you look at pictures of cars on the internet, they look you're big. like, that thing looks so big, but then you see it in person, and it's they're tiny. tiny. Yeah. And people were smaller back then, too, so it doesn't, you don't get a good <laughs> scale. They were. It. You ever look at, like, old suits? Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, like, I have. <laughs> <laughs> you ever look at old suits that I bought from <laughs> H&M a year ago? <laughs> smaller now. They're <laughs> smaller now. It's somehow, everyone was smaller, including me. <sighs> you know what sucks is buying a different suit for every new wedding. Because <laughs> you just are getting fat that quick. Yeah, and like you think back to when you wore that suit and you're like, man, I thought I was fat back then. Yeah. yeah. Like I oh, didn't man. feel good about myself back yeah. then. That's, I, I've... Now I'm, I would kill to be that skinny now. I think back to when I played high school in football and I was like 185 pounds and I'm like, man, I'm so big. And I was like yeah. almost the same height uh -huh. as a senior, but then like looking back at pictures, you're just like, wow, dude, you're in great shape. Yeah. yeah. I get pictures of myself when I was younger, and I just get so sad because now I just look like my dad. I don't know. I look the same from like 20 to 30. Yeah. <laughs> and I look at pictures of myself like three years ago, and I'm like, who's that? Oh, fuck. It's me. <laughs> um, when I went to the doctor's office this week, they took my height, and all this time I thought I was 6'1 since like, I've been, I've been telling people I'm 6'1 for years now. Mm -hmm. Turns out I'm 6'8. <laughs> Six foot. Damn. Six foot. You're not even tall. No. I'm no. I'm just above average. You're just a guy. I'm a I'm above average by one inch. If you say you're six foot, I assume you're five eleven. I know. <laughs> yeah. Know? I'm tall. You are tall. Taller than you. I'm three inches taller than yeah. you. We thought I was only two inches taller. Now you're Damn. three. Yeah. Good thing you've had the these shows for a while, because I don't know if I <laughs> I'd give a six foot guy a show. <laughs> Trying to have some tall Ugh. boys bring some tall dudes to YouTube. Get Rutledge in. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Rutledge was Rutledge tall. Rutledge Wood, tall. Cletus McFarland, tall. Is James he? Pumphrey, tall. Yeah. Gus Johnson. Gus Johnson. Gus. Taller than I thought. Way taller than yeah. I thought. He's taller than tall I am. Tall boy, yeah. He's like 6'4". It's because he's so beefy. He's got yeah. that Midwest beef on him, and he just looks <laughs> proportional. Looks like he took like yeah. a short guy. He just looks like a bigger guy. <laughs> yeah. It's like when uh, have you, I'm watching that The Toys That Made Us. Yeah, yeah. It's like... A G.I. Joe, but then Gus walks in, and it's like when they made the WWF guys. Oh, were those bigger? Yeah, they were bigger than all the other uh, action figures. <laughs> that's why they sold better, because everyone's like, oh, yeah, I can, like, oh, that's a big toy. thunk them together. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, back to boring car stuff. <laughs> no, let's just riff. <laughs> it's just like a show about hanging out. Yeah, let's do a show where it's like three white guys with facial hair hang out. Yeah, and we talk about just, you know, stuff. Yeah, and guy things. What's our opinion yeah. on it? You know, I got a hot take for you. You know, white guys need a voice finally. <laughs> finally, they gave three white guys a show. <laughs> In the GTR's first two years of competition, it racked up 49 wins, which is basically a win every other week, or every week. I'm bad at math. It also earned itself a cute little nickname. That's not right. What? Two years, that's 104 oh. weeks. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, it, <laughs> the GTR was boxy, or hako in Japanese. It was also a suka, or skyline in Japanese. The Hako Suka. Oh. Which, um, side note, sorry. Suka means bitch in Russian. Oh, cool. So it's also a boxy bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with so many wins right out of the gate, Sakurai-san knew he found a winning formula. Little car, big engine, make it handle. Can't Ooh, lose. That's a recipe for success, mm -hmm. baby. Nissan was stoked. 
1971, they took the two back doors off the GTR to make it a true coupe and sold it alongside the sedan. The 71 GTR Coupe had a shorter wheelbase and was a wider... I should clarify at this point, Nissan owns Prince. Yeah. That's why they were stoked. Mm-hmm. Good. If you want to learn more about that, check out the episode... 100. The first... Or the first and 100th episodes of Up to Speed are on the Skyline. Yeah. They're great episodes. Uh, in 1971, the GTR Coupe had a shorter wheelbase and was wider than the previous model and looked more aggressive, too. Shorter and more aggressive looking, question mark? The Coupe also came... <laughs> Who is this, Turtle? <laughs> <laughs> From entourage. Yeah, nice. <laughs> that show's still on the air. Uh, <laughs> no. The coupe also came with wider tires and a rear spoiler. Uh, there was no mistake that this Nissan was a true sports car, gentlemen. <laughs> Shinichiro overhauled the GTR entirely in 1972, this time adopting some muscle car fastback flavor. Beautiful car. Uh, it still had the same 2-liter S20 engine as the previous cars. Thanks to a strange marketing campaign featuring two fun-loving kids named Mary and Ken, uh, this GTR is often referred to as the Ken Mary. Unlike the previous cars, though, the GTR was not available in four-door form. Uh, and for clarification, the, the Skyline still was. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted a GTR, you could only get it in two doors. Yeah. Um, weird coincidence. My grandpa's name was Ken, and my sister's name is Mary. Wow. Even though it looked like a muscle car, the Ken Mary sure didn't drive on, like one. Also, I saw one of these randomly went to a dog beach in Long Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, Long Dog Beach. Dog. It's a wiener dog. Yeah, beach. It's only wiener dogs in no. Corky. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> a Long Dog Beach. Uh, Rosie's Dog Beach. It's great. I love it. Uh, I met this guy. I can't remember his first name, but he goes by Zero Rust on Instagram. Um, he brought his Ken Mary out to shoot. That's a good looking oh, car. Nice. It's super cool. His is a replica, but he basically used a bunch of GTR parts on it. Um, oh, so it's just a normal Skyline? It, I don't even think it's a Skyline. I think it's um, some other Nissan model. <coughs> Interesting. I'm an ignorant person. Um, it's a Ford Flex. With... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's actually, yeah. Even though the uh, Ken Mary looked like a muscle car, it didn't drive like one. It was available with front and rear disc brakes, which was pretty uncommon for the time. Unfortunately, Nissan was only able to pump out 197 of the Ken Marys because a little thing called the grass, grass crisis, the gas crisis, rather, happened. And Japan instituted crazy stringent emission regulations, which the Ken Mary did not pass. It looked like the GTR was destined to rest in eternal slumber until... 1984. GTR father Sakurai son had fallen ill and was unable to complete the design of the next generation Skyline. He gave the assignment to the only man he trusted with the task, an engineer named Naganori Ito. Ito-san had been a student of Shinichiro for years and was ready to do his mentor proud. It's a lot of pressure. I know, it's a, I know what that's like. Uh, the next Skyline, the R31, was slated to release in 1985, just the next year. Ito-san was incredibly nervous about taking over the project. Sakurai was a legendary figure in the Japanese auto industry at this point, a man who was known to call the Skyline his alter ego, and Naganori had to finish designing its successor while his boss was in the hospital. Damn, dude, this is just like what happened to you. Basically. You had to host Bumper to Bumper, which is an extension of me. It's yeah. my alter ego. And then you had to host it while I was in the hospital. Yeah, I relate, man. You're Sakurai-san. And you are Naganori Ito. I'm Nolanori Ito. <laughs> yeah, and I'm <laughs> Pumfrocky son. <laughs> uh, what was a young man to do? Well, he did his best. Uh, high performance variants of the R31 Skyline include the GTS, which was equipped with a four wheel steering system called HiCast that could turn the rear wheels to help the car get around turns. The GTS also had an electronically adjustable front air dam that changed position depending on the car's speed. Pretty sweet. The top of the line R31 GTS R was equipped with a two liter turbocharged inline six called the RB20 DET. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Despite the moderate success of the Group A R31 race car, the R31 dropped an 85 to lukewarm reception. Skyline diehards are tough, tough crowd to please, and the new car just didn't do it for them. They shouldn't 
They should stop letting Luke rate cars too, though. <laughs> Luke warm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I got it. Great. Love that. Uh, there I'm was glad a, you came yeah. along, Joe. There, <laughs> I'm glad you're here. There wasn't a GTR model of the R31. I know uh, that this car wasn't popular, but I think they look they're great. They're cool. They're coming back. Like you, I see a lot of builds on Instagram now with those, mm-hmm. and they look they look sick. They I love look them. so good. They look like uh, like an '80s race car. Yeah. And the wagon one we got was. Oh my god! Sick. Yeah. Yeah. Our friend Sean has an R31 wagon. Yeah. He let us. That's really cool. Kind of borrow it a little bit. I got to drive it around, uh, with the whole crew in the back. It was super fun. That was really cool because like our office is in Sawtell, which is like uh, like. Like almost like a little. They call it Little Osaka. Little Osaka, yeah. Uh, so it's just really cool to drive like a vintage mm-hmm. Japanese car. Like, Past all the Japanese restaurants. Yeah, it was super fun. Did you get some looky loos? Not really. I think because I like I did get some looky loos when I parked like a dickhead in front of Black Market and people <laughs> were like, "What are you doing?" Because <laughs> it's right hand drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was hard to. It. It was fun. Good times. Um. On on the track, uh, the Nissan was outpaced by in Group A by Ford and their Sierra Cosworth RS500. Another great looking car. A fascinating race car that deserves its own episode eventually. Uh, the R31 sales weren't great, and Nissan was no longer the king at the track. It was time for a do-over. Feeling that he had shamed himself and that he literally brought dishonor to his mentor, Ito-san went back to the drawing board. He got working on a true successor to the cars Sakurai San had made a worldwide phenomenon. Nagamori started with a clean slate. The R31's reception had falters had faltered Nissan's reputation as a performance leader. The new car would have to change that. The next GTR would be designed with one objective in mind in two phases. One, retake the Japanese touring car championship Group A crown. And step number two, take over the world. That's right. To achieve that, the what does new, that mean? Just gotta win, just win, baby. To achieve that, the new GTR would have to be totally different than anything Nagamori, Ito, or Nissan, for that matter, had ever designed before. Every decision was made with racing as the prime focus. Originally, the GTR team decided that the car would be powered by a twin turbocharged 2.4 liter version of the RB25 inline six, making 312 horsepower. But since the engine was turboed, Group A rules dictated that the car would have to run in a larger engine class with smaller tires, which would make it harder to drive. 312 ponies was a great amount of power back then, but running a rear-wheel drive setup with relatively skinny 255 tires meant the car was probably going to oversteer like hell when driven fast. Those are small tires. Yeah. For a race car? Yeah. Those are extremely small. I have 255s on my Volkswagen Tiguan, <laughs> and they don't look wide. <laughs> And you've only won like a couple championships. I've only won yeah. two Japanese touring car championships <laughs> in it. Shouts to KW, Rotiform, Toyo, and APR. There you go. A slidey boy isn't going to dominate Group A. So they made the decision to make the new GTR all wheel drive. But Nissan's existing Atezza all wheel drive system was heavy, about 200 pounds altogether. So Nagamori and the team decided that the engine would be bigger to make up the difference. The new engine had a larger stroke than the previous <laughs> RB. T- <laughs> yeah, I had a real large stroke this morning. <laughs> the new engine had a larger stroke than the previous RB25, which increased the displacement. They called it the RB26 DETT. Uh, 26 was an abbreviation for 2.6 liters, and TT stood for twin turbo. Alternate joke. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it, man, it's, it, man, it's depressing when your son has a larger stroke than you. <laughs> Ito me, me and my dad weren't ass buddies. <laughs> oh my God. I listened back to that. Asshole buddies. Asshole buddies. <laughs> if you haven't checked out our Smoky Unit, Smoky Unit episodes, it's a two parter on Smoky Unit. A very interesting super guy. Fun. Yeah. Uh, he, has eclipsed Carol Shelby as my favorite character from automotive history, so check that one out. Nice. Yeah, fascinating person. Great episode. Super fun episode. Super too. fun. Ito-san and the team dreamed up a new body to tuck this new engine under. The new and improved R32 GTR was a sporty but understated coupe. 
Compared to the R31, the new car looked like it was not one, but two generations ahead of the old car. The R31 was cutting edge for its time, but looked like a relic next to the new R32. When Nissan married the new chassis and new drivetrain together, something amazing happened. The new car was great. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Starting in 1989, the R32 GTR race car was entered in the Japanese Touring Car Championships Group A, the series it was designed to dominate. And you know what? It did. (laughs) Out of all 29 races that entered, the R32 won every single one. Uh, That blue uh, CalSonic car from Gran Turismo, you might remember that, Joe? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone does. Uh, I think that car is the reason that us and a lot of our audience are into cars. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, our dads liked car magazines, and we liked video games. I remember it being really hard to get that car. Yeah. It was really hard to get that car, and nobody knew what it was because we didn't get it in the States, and everyone's like... Why does that Maxima go so fast? <laughs> like, why does that square car it doesn't look fast at all? Why is that the fastest car? And then everyone got on the dial up, little be dee dee call, <laughs> and then was like, oh, you've got mail. Have you guys heard of this car from Japan? <laughs> Mom, get off the phone. <laughs> oh, my mom just called, <laughs> kicked me off. This picture I'm downloading of this car <laughs> stopped loading. It starts as like four pixels. <laughs> uh, that car won both the 1990 and 1994 JTCC championships, cementing it as the most famous of all the R32 race cars. In 1990, the R32 went over to the Nürburgring and ran in a 24-hour race there and won. It went to Spa, Francorchamps, and won there. It went to Macau. and Did it win? It won there. Uh, But the R32's most impactful victories were yet to come. Gibson Motorsport was a private racing team based in Australia that specialized in Group A and Group C Nissans. In 1990, Gibson got their hands on a Nismo-tuned R32 race car. It had key upgrades over the regular GTR. The race cars had a steel turbo compressor wheel instead of ceramic, uh, intercooler ducting in the front bumper, a front splitter, a ducktail spoiler under the stock one, unnecessary parts like air conditioning, anti-lock brakes, and rear windshield wipers were taken off. Homologation rules mandated that Nissan build 500 of these things for sale to the public. I want to get one and make it left-hand drive. Uh, and just piss everybody off. <sighs> hmm. dude, I'm I'm gonna, I want to own a left-hand drive Skyline one day. I think that's so cool. All right. Uh, Gibson had a ton of experience building the rear-wheel drive R31, but figured out that parts for the new all-wheel drive car would be way more expensive. Well, how'd they figure that? Over the R32 build process, Gibson racked up a tab of over $1 million with Nissan building that car. <laughs> Uh, They couldn't afford to do that every season, so Gibson decided they would just build Nissan parts themselves. By the time Gibson was finished racing the R32 a few years later, only the body, front and rear cross members, and engine block were built by Nissan. Gibson manufactured everything else. That's crazy. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff. Have you ever thought about how many pieces there are in your car? Thousands. More than six. At least. At least. (laughs) Teslas only have four parts. Battery in the car, <laughs> <laughs> the wheels and the seats, the, in, the, the inside, the outside, the battery. Yeah, okay, that's three. And the, the people. Motor. <laughs> that's four. <laughs> uh, like in the JTCC, the Gibson R32s dominated Australian Group A racing. The twin turbo all wheel drive monsters embarrassed the competition. Gibson Motorsport and the Nissan GTR won the ATCC Group A Championship in 1990, uh, 1991, yeah. and 92. Nice. Same year as the Olympics. Dream team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the absolutely crushing victories earned a nickname, a nickname for these beastly Nissans. They were titans from the land of the rising sun that smashed anything in their path. From then on, the GTR would be known around the world as Godzilla. (laughs) (laughs) When you read it like that, it's like we all know the skyline is called Godzilla, but it's not often that so much thought goes into a nickname. It's like, yeah, it's from Japan. 
It's a freaking Titan and it crushes everything. It's Godzilla. And it's like, whoa. Yeah, that's the maybe the coolest nickname for any car. But the, I, from my understanding, the Australian press made this up uh, because they were just like kicking ass. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was not meant to be a compliment. No. It was supposed to be like negative. Yeah. But I don't see how they figure that at all. Like, if anyone called me Godzilla, yeah, like James Pumphrey is the Godzilla of automotive YouTube. I'd yeah. be like, "Fuck yeah, I oh, am. Yeah. Thank no. you. <laughs> no, it's not a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't mean it in oh, a good no. way. There's Nolan. He's handsome guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. Joe Weber, the uh, Ryan Gosling <laughs> of automotive writers. He doesn't have a personal life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant, I meant that. <laughs> I meant <laughs> that you talk kind of funny. <laughs> the GTR achieved its last victory in Japan at the 1992 Tui's 1000 at Bathurst. Three laps into the race, and the Gibson R32, sponsored by Winfield Cigarettes, took the lead. Uh, later, a heavy rainstorm descended onto the Mount Panorama circuit. Cars were crashing left and right, taking them out of contention. But you know what the GTR had? All wheel drive. All wheel drive, baby. Uh, that didn't really help, though, because uh, the Winfield GTR also fell victim while it was in the lead. Dang. While limping back to the pits, the Winfield car was passed by a Ford, so it wasn't in the lead anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Race officials, though, ordered a red flag finish, halting all the cars on the track and resetting the race position by one previous lap. This was great for the Nissan fans, but not great. For the Ford fans in yeah. attendance, which being in Australia was like everybody. Yeah. After the controversial red flag call, the Just, bright- here's here's a note for all the umpires and officials out there. Just never make that decision. Yeah. <laughs> like never call back a game winning touchdown on like a late flag or something. Never restart the race a lap ahead if someone loses the lead. Just never ever do that yeah uh the bright red winfield r32 sat in the winner's circle for the last time ford fans flooded the podium celebration with booze as the gibson drivers sprayed champagne into the crowd while they were giving booze they were spraying booze Booze. nice just gave them knuckles across the table that's That's what we're here for that's what we came to do boys (laughs) the race fans were (laughs) Uh, race fans are tired of seeing Nissan's win all the time, so for the 1993 season, the ATCC changed its rules, heavily favoring the V8-powered Fords. The R32 would no longer be the dominant force in Australia. Regardless, the impact the R32 had on the racing world was undeniable. Nagonori Ito, his team, and Gibson Motorsport had achieved Nissan's goal of reclaiming the performance f- throne. How do you follow that up, guys? We'll find out next week Ooh. on Past Gas. That's a cliffhanger. Oh, I'm edgy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, great cars, great uh, story. Really I didn't know anything about story. that R30, R38, the Prince supercar. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of like driving footage from that on track, but I think that thing's super cool. They brought it over to uh, Pebble Beach this year, actually. Yeah, uh, I wish I could have seen that. Thanks for listening to Past Guests. Make sure you tune in next week for part two yeah. of the Skyline GTR. That's right. My name is James Pumphrey. You can follow me on Instagram at James Pumphrey. You can follow Nolan at Nolan J. Sykes. Thank you. Can you. Follow Joe at Dark Webinar. <laughs> follow Donut Media at Donut Media on Twitter and everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're listening to this, you've probably seen our YouTube channel. But if not, we have a ton of video shows that come out every week all about cars and most of them are funny and fun uh, like 80% of them yeah <laughs> uh, alright I love you be nice hanger a hanger grabbed a plane and just like started doing all these tricks and shit and landed at a party no at a <laughs> <laughs> I came to that story a little late I, heard, I thought they were at a party no at an air show oh an air a, show and a, a female pilot crashed and the guy was like See? What a dick. I know, right? <laughs>